embryology primarily looks at the, for, uh, the formation of an organism from the moment of fertilization to the moment of its birth. That's essentially what embryology encompasses. Development, on the other hand, developmental biology encompasses much more than that. For example, development's going on in your body right now. What am I talking about? Primarily, you are regenerating 3 million red blood cells a second. You're regenerating 10 to the 10 red blood cells a day, or 10 to the 11th, yeah, 100 trillion red blood cells a day. That's developmental biology. Your body is constantly taking the stem cells that are in your bone marrow, that are in your skin, that are in the various organs, and regenerating your tissues. So regeneration is one of those things that also belongs to developmental biology. It's not just about how the embryo forms and until birth, but it's for your entire life. In fact, that's what keeps you alive, is regeneration. In some organisms, it's also used for metamorphosis. The easiest way to explain metamorphosis is certain organisms, like frogs or um, you know, caterpillars and whatnot, in their larval stage, as we call them, they're juveniles, so to speak. They, have, they don't have the ability to reproduce. They essentially just eat and disperse themselves or whatnot. And then the metamorphosis process is actually a form of sexual maturing to where they can then start reproducing. And in a lot of cases, the uh, larval stage is a lot longer than the adult stage for some of these organisms. So metamorphosis is one of those things that also is um, part of developmental biology because, you know, you have things that are developing wings, such as caterpillars and the butterflies. Frogs develop limbs and other types of uh, things in order to be able to function. So it's uh, quite a dramatic process for them as well to accomplish this in their environment. Okay, so what is the main difference between the two? Again, embryology is part of developmental biology. Embryology studies the stages from fertilization to birth, whereas development not, uh, goes beyond that, not just the, the development of the embryo, but also the constant renewal of cells throughout an organism's life. That's one of the main things that keeps us alive is the regeneration of your tissues. That's why you get wrinkles. That's why you get organ failure. It's because when your stem cells stop regenerating those tissues, then the organs stop doing, uh, they fail, essentially. Okay? So that's the main difference between the two. There are some more subtle differences that I'm not going to go over, such as usually when you take an embryology course, you don't study the genetics behind it, but in development we do. We study a lot of the genetics and proteins and interactions. In embryology, it's more about the morphology and the functionality of the various systems as they develop and doesn't necessarily ask all of the how questions. How do your neurons find their muscles and the other tissues and things of that sort, whereas development does. What is it that we study when we're studying developmental biology? The question that we always ask is how does every cell in the body, all of the diversity that makes up the trillions of cells that are in your body, in reality there's only about 256 types of cells in the human body, but of that great diversity of the hundreds of different types of cells, how do you go from that single zygote, the single fertilized egg, to all of that diversity? And then, of course, the continuity of life from one generation to the next, we look at the uh, sexual reproduction and the formation of the gametes, essentially, of the various organisms as well. So not only the formation of life, but the continuation of life through reproductive success. Differentiation is essentially the process that a cell uh, goes through to take on a particular fate. Now, when we say fate, let's do the analogy. Right now, you're going to school, and each one of you are taking on a particular fate on what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Um, you know, the more, you, more schooling you do, the further along you are, the more you're not going to go back and study something different. I'm stuck in my profession. I love it. I'm glad I am. But that's the same thing for cells. Most of the time, cells, they go down a particular path of what we call differentiation. And when they reach that end goal, it's very difficult for them to be anything else. So the differentiation process is a process where a stem cell becomes some specific cell type, you know, where a stem cell becomes skin tissue or even a different, you know, part of the skin. 
or becomes a neuron. And there's a wide variety of different neurons. Each one is down a different path, as we call them. Um, so the differentiation process is the diversity that the cells generate from that zygote to all the different types of cells and tissues that are in your body. Morphogenesis is essentially the process that cells go through in this process of differentiation. What I mean by that is the cells will take on different shapes and they will start expressing different genes and, um, and behave differently from one another and move. So morphogenesis kind of describes some of the mechanics of how a cell changes its shape, how it changes uh, its position relative to other cells, uh, so to speak. So when you think of something morphine, you think of it changing shape or whatnot. That's kind of what morphogenesis is. In fact, there's really only two stages that a cell takes on in morphogenesis. One is it's connected to other cells, which we call epithelial uh, cells. One, uh, the other one is called mesenchyme cells, where they're detached from other cells. For example, most of the tissues in your body are connected to one another. But you do have some cells that are free-floating, part of your cardiovascular system, your lymphatic system, that aren't connected to other tissues physically. They're independent of each other. So in the same process of um, how organisms start forming their various layers and their various tissues, morphogenesis is that movement and change of the cell's shape during the differentiation process. Now, growth is one of those things that it may seem pretty obvious in terms of you know, development, but there are different strategies for different organisms. For example, a frog embryo, which we call a xenopus, initially starts out um, as one huge egg, uh, one huge oocyte, essentially. Now, this is showing some of the cell divisions that occur at a later stage, but it initially starts as one large oocyte. And then what happens is, after a while, this will divide into hundreds of tiny cells without going through any of the growth stages. Now, this isn't the same for other organisms. For example, for uh, um, human cells or whatnot, we'll grow a little bit and then we'll divide. And then the cells will grow and then they'll divide. So they, they remain pretty much the same size. They have to grow a little bit and then they go through mitosis and whatnot. Um, growth is one of those things that ultimately has to occur for the organism to be able to get larger but it doesn't always occur at the same rate for every organism. So in development, each organism has their strategy on whether they're going to grow and then divide, and then grow and then divide, or whether they're just going to divide, 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 grow a little bit, divide some more, grow a little bit more. It's very tightly regulated as far as how often the cells grow and divide. Reproduction. This is, again, one of the uh, um, things that in development we look uh, at because in some cases, the cells that will form the gametes are almost produced right away. In some organisms, these cells are committed to become the, what we call germline cells almost right away within the first few cell divisions. In other cases, they may not produce the stem cells that will form the germline until way later on. So like I said too, in some organisms that undergo metamorphosis, they're sexually immature and then once they go, go through that metamorphosis, then they're able to reproduce the gametes that are necessary for sexual reproduction. Okay, so reproduction, again, is one of those things that has different stages. Um, I teach in my basic biology class, and, and um, a lot of people don't know this, but in, even in human physiology, the cycle of reproduction uh, is fundamentally different between males and females. Females will produce all of the oocytes that they'll ever ovulate, for their entire life before they're even born. So as the fetus is developing, they form every single oocyte that they're ever going to have. Then those just start maturing a little bit as they reach sexual maturity. And then by the time they reach sexual maturity, they've lost like three-fourths of those uh, uh, oocytes. And then they start ovulating the oocytes that are undergoing that process. Men won't even start producing sperm until they reach sexual maturity, even though we have the stem cells in our testes, we do not start producing that until we reach sexual maturity. So there's a big fundamental difference between when these cells start being made in male and female between, uh, and humans at least too. Evolution. 
um, this is huge because in reality, massive changes in an organism's physiology can occur from a simple change in a single gene in, uh, during the fetal development. Because these genes have such a control over um, whether or not legs form and whether or not wings form in, in the case of uh, various insects, in fact, there's a single mutation in a single gene that is found to be one of the fundamental differences between insects that can fly and insects that can't fly. And it just comes down to that one gene on whether wings are made or whether extra legs are made uh, in those organisms. So simple, basic mutations can lead to drastic changes uh, amongst species. And then last but not least, environmental integration. This is one of those things that it's the habitat that uh, changes um, how the organism develops. The temperature um, and so on and so forth can have a dramatic difference on uh, when and how the organism undergoes its metamorphosis. Um, and uh, even um, as we'll show when we, get to, yeah, when we get to vertebrate, we start talking about axis patterning, um, we'll show that even gravity itself, uh, when a chicken embryo is being laid or whatnot, the gravity itself can actually create polarity in the cell so that when the organism starts to develop it, it has different axes, the you know, anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral axes. So environment has, uh, uh, and, and many developmental processes, plays an integral role um, in terms of how the organism can develop. It's not just genetics. Um, so that's another important thing we have to consider when looking at developmental biology is the environmental integration. Now let me show you again just an illustration. There are three colors that you should be, well four actually, that you should be familiar with that you're going to see throughout your uh, textbook. In the differentiation process, we concern ourselves primarily with three main colors, blue, red, and yellow. So what do these colors represent? Well, blue is typically used to represent what we call the ectoderm. Okay? So these are the germ layers. When a zygote, which is the fertilized egg, starts dividing and becoming multiple cells and undergoes morphogenesis, or the movement of those cells around, starts forming into these various layers, what we call germ layers. And each germ layer has a particular fate or derivative, or I should say, um, set of uh, cells and tissues that it will become due to the nature of where it's found. That's its fate, so to speak. So the ectoderm, when you, and, and each organism can have a different assortment and arrangement of these. So when you look at cells and when you look at the, these embryos uh, throughout your book, Blue is the universal color that we give to the ectoderm. Mesoderm is red, and all of the mesoderm components that come from that are in red. And yellow is used to, do, uh, uh, to illustrate the endoderm. Okay? Now, purple is not used as often because it doesn't always show up in the initial stages, but that's the germline cells. Those are the sex cells uh, or the uh, um, stem cells that will uh, form the gametes in an organism. Most of the time, we don't really get to that point in most of the pictures um, to show the, the purple. So mainly, it's going to be blue, red, and yellow. In fact, let me show you cross-section of a frog or xenopus embryo. This is kind of what I'm talking about, where the outer layer here in blue, this is going to become things such as the skin, as well as the nervous system, the brain and the spinal column and the neurons. Now that is one thing I'm going to test you on, just your basic understanding of what the derivatives of each germ layer are. Because that's really what most of what we're going to study this entire semester is how does the ectoderm become the skin and become the brain and become the spinal column and whatnot? How does the mesoderm become all of its components? Okay. So again, there's three main things that the uh, ectoderm becomes. It's essentially the skin. It becomes the, uh, uh, the nervous system. Um, you know, you could split hairs and say it also becomes the pigment cells of the skin, but that's part of the skin as well. So the two main derivatives are skin and neurons. So skin and neurons are derived from the ectoderm. Mesoderm has a quite a bit more to it. Mesoderm has a lot of stuff. For example, it becomes your bone. It becomes your muscles. 
um, it becomes um, let's see your kidneys, it becomes your gonads or the sex organs. It it forms certain parts of your um, spinal column, but not neurons. More of the connective tissue in between the vertebrae. But again, that's part of bone and cartilage. So mesoderm, its main components are bone, muscle, kidneys, and then the sex organs like the gonads. And then the endoderm is the two other main uh, aspects of um, physiology, which are your digestive system as well as your respiratory system, your lungs and things of that sort. So all of the components of your digestive system, your esophagus, your stomach, your liver, your pancreas, your you know, large and small intestines, all of those are derived from the endoderm. So the endoderm, again, now, one of the things that confuses people is don't think that endoderm just means inside, because in fact, the ectoderm becomes your nervous system, which is one of the most central parts of your body that's protected by the other layers. So just because we say ectoderm and skin is one of those derivatives, that's not just because it's not, it's not just an outer layer, okay? Another thing that people tend to confuse is the terminology ectoderm and epithelial. So let me explain the difference between those two. Ectoderm is a germ layer. However, all three of these germ layers can form epithelial cells. So what's the difference? Epithelial cells are typically a covering of sorts. So even your esophagus, which is part of your digestive system, has epithelial cells that coat and that protect the, you know, as your food goes down and so on and so forth. So epithelial cells just refers more to the nature of the cells being a covering and a coating, okay, rather than it being synonymous with ectoderm and skin. That's one of the things that people tend to confuse. Morphogenesis is the process of the cells changing their shape and their place during development. Differentiation, on the other hand, is the process of a cell um, having a different function. Okay? So that's one of the main differences between the two. I'm going to explain things a couple of different ways just so it hopefully sinks in. So again, differentiation. Again, think about it in terms of you going to school. The further along your path you go, the more concrete or set you're, you are in that discipline. And the same thing is true for cells. And that's one of the things that we study in development and its application, because can we take cells that have gone down this path and turn them into something else? Well, yeah, we can. It's a very difficult process, but we can take skin and turn it into neurons. Now, hopefully, you know that it's not that big of a step to do so, because they both originate from the same germ layer. So it's not too difficult to take skin and turn it into neurons. It is a little more difficult to take skin and maybe turn it into something else, like muscle or some type of endoderm cell, because they go down a very different path in their differentiation. All right. Now, in the morphogenesis process, where the cells change their position and their shape, I said that there were two different forms in which the cells can be found. You have the epithelial cells, and then you have the mesenchymal, or sometimes just called mesenchyme, cells. So epithelial cells essentially are connected in one form or another to other cells. Now, the way in which they're connected can vary. There's quite a number of ways in which they can form certain structures. Mesenchyme cells pretty much are easy. They're not connected to other cells. So, and cells can go from epithelial to mesenchyme back to epithelial during this process of morphogenesis. They don't always stay as one. They can originate as epithelial, then they change and they become mesenchyme as they move, and then they'll reform new sheets and become epithelial cells again. So really, again, epithelial just means connected, and mesenchyme means loose or not connected to other cells. So again, there's a wide variety of ways. One of the words that I will use quite a bit, so just be familiar with it for later on, is delamination. Because delamination is one of those processes, one of the more common processes when cells go from an epithelial to a mesenchyme 
transition, where they go from a sheet of cells to individual migrating cells, so to speak. Mesenchyme cells, again, there's other terms that we'll use. Um, most of these you're not going to necessarily see, but condensation is one of those. Just like water vapor condenses and becomes water droplets, condensation is a transition of cells from a mesenchyme to an epithelial state. So they're literally aggregating or coming together and forming a ball or forming a sheet or whatever the, the case may be. So delamination and condensation, those are two that I use more often than any others uh, to describe these transitions from epithelial to mesenchyme and, and, and back again. Okay, so delamination, that's just one that talks about cells going from an epithelial to mesenchyme. And condensation is one where the free-floating mesenchyme cells co coalesce together and form an epithelial connective type of tissue. These are part of morphogenesis. Okay. They're not necessarily used to describe differentiation. Okay. I, I, I really am I'm emphasizing this. I know I'm, I'm kind of overkilling it, but this, this is one of those things that even by the end of the semester, some people have a big problem with. So morphogenesis, these changing of the shape of the cells as well as their position, that's epithelial and mesenchyme cells. What shape are they? What cells are they associated with? Where do they move to? Where are they migrating? That's all morphogenesis. Differentiation comes down to what genes are being expressed and what proteins are being made in the cell. That's where differentiation comes down to, is what genes are, are expressed and therefore what proteins are being made. That's the cell's function. All right. Now, there's three ways in which we study uh, the embryological as well as the regenerative um, aspects of developmental biology. And in, throughout history, they kind of go in this order. They started with the anatomical approach, then they went to the experimental approach. Now we're at the stage where we can manipulate genetics so well that genetics is mostly used to study developmental biology. However, all of these have their place even today in uh, studying development. However, most of what we are learning today has to do with genetic, the genetic approach to embryology rather than just the anatomical experimental approach. So I'm going to explain all three of these. Anatomical. Um, scientists have been studying the structure of, uh, of embryos for a long time. I mean, even before microscopes were invented, you can see and actually trace, um, uh, uh, especially with chicken embryos, um, since you can open up the, the, the um, shell at certain stages, and see the anatomy at a particular stage. So the first anatomical approach is what we call comparative embryology, um, which is comparing organisms, different species, based upon uh, uh, their stages of development. And they found that in some species, like in humans and chickens and, and mice and things of that sort, that there are certain stages that are almost identical in terms of what's happening. Again, it doesn't tell you the genetics behind it or other things. It's just more of a physical approach to saying, oh, here's when the limbs are forming. Oh, and it forms right here in the mouse. And oh, it forms right here in the humans and so on and so forth. So it's more of comparing the overall structures. Um, to get a good idea as far as what's forming when and, and so on and so forth. Again, there's a limitation to what you can derive by comparative embryology. But there are some questions that can be answered with that. Evolutionary biology, by comparing closely related species to one another and, again, looking at some of the morphological differences between their anatomy. That's another way which we can kind of study a little bit about some of the differences between development in one organism or another. Probably the more useful approach today that's still used because of the nature of uh, studies on humans where we don't do experimental or genetic studies on humans, um, at least not in the US, um, is teratology. So what is teratology? It's basically the study of birth defects. And 
by studying birth defects, this tells us a lot about what's going on to development. For example, why do you have to have folic acid? Why do we need to supplement folic acid for uh, some women um, to prevent things like spina bifida? It's because we've seen that when there's an absence of this, we, we have that particular uh, um, problem occurring. Now, due to genetic studies, we know why that's the case. But um, teratology essentially says, oh, uh, you were exposed to this during the pregnancy and, and the child has this problem. Okay, there must be some correlation there. So teratology is still used today because when things pop up, when abnormalities pop up in the uh, structures of humans especially, then we say, well, you know, what was it about the mother's pregnancy? Was it there something? Was there an environmental condition? Is there a genetic cause to this? That ultimately has a correlation. It's kind of like when your car won't start. You know that there are several things that are associated with the car's ignition and its starting, and, you know, you can say, well, what has the car been through? Oh, it's really cold outside. It's probably having to do with this. So it's the same thing as trying to diagnose what's going on based upon certain abnormalities um, uh, of development. So teratology is essentially the study of birth defects. And that's taught us quite a bit about human development. Now, I'm not really going to test you on mathematical modeling, but it's, a, it's one of those that's kind of up and coming. Um, I've never used it, but ultimately, it's a way of making predictions of how uh, structures form. There is a form of mathematical symmetry in life when you look at certain structures. Uh, certain flowers have a, a, a certain mathematical relationship to them uh, in their development. And so mathematical modeling is one of those things where they can take what we know and try to use the, the mathematics behind it to predict how things are supposed to form and get more information along that line. It's very complex, um, but there are a number of individuals that are working out those, those formulas to do so. I mean, math has its role in biology in that, you know, even the relationship between the blood pressure and the dilation of your blood vessels, there's a mathematical relationship that is absolute between that. So we can use math to ultimately make predictions about um, how structures should form and thereby understand more about development in that regard. Now, again, this is one of the more primitive approaches. It's not quite used as much today because we learn so much more with the experimental and the genetic approaches. So let's get into those. The experimental approach, there's two main ways in which we do experiments. Now, in these experiments, there really is no genetic manipulation. It's merely uh, changing the position of, of cells. And when I say change the positions, I also mean just complete removal of the cells. Because one of the things that we find with experimental uh, uh, embryology is that if you remove certain parts of the cells during a particular stage, the other cells can actually compensate for that and regenerate that tissue, which tells us that those cells aren't fully, uh, haven't fully received their fate yet. But in some cases, when we remove certain cells at a particular stage, then that part's just gone. It never forms during the development. So when we do experiments where we take parts away, when we cut off a limb and it doesn't regenerate at a, at a certain stage or whatnot, we know, hey, at this point, these cells have become committed. Nothing else can replace them. They're gone. In other cases, you can remove a huge chunk, like in the frog embryo, you can come in here and remove a huge chunk of it, and it'll just renew it. It'll just regenerate the whole chunk again, and, and it'll be just fine. So experiment, that's one. Ablation is the removal. Uh, if you think obliterate or ablation, I don't know, however, whatever you want to use to use the, for some type of a mnemonic, ablation is the destruction or removal. Uh, sometimes it's just the destruction of. You don't actually remove the cells. You just kill the cells. And there's different things you can learn from that. But ablation is the removal or destruction of cells in an, in an embryo. Transplantation is one of those where if the species is closely related, for example, I, I've uh, um, read a number of articles, I never did it myself, but I read a number of articles where quails and chicken embryos, they're so similar genetically and in, in, in terms of their embryology that you can transplant cells 
and they'll behave just fine. Well, I'll explain how that's useful in, in a little bit, but we can actually take cells from one embryo and put it into another, take cells from another embryo and put it into another. It doesn't always have to be from different species. It can be within the same species, and that tells us a lot, too. We can take cells from down here in the somite region and put them up by the head and see what they do, or vice versa. And what we find when we do that, when we transplant cells from one part to another, is, again, we find out whether those cells have the potential to become that part of the head, you know, part of the brain or part of the skin or whatnot. Because there comes a point where the cells differentiate and can no longer take on a different fate. For example, if you take cells from here and put them up to the head, they'll try to form muscle instead of brain at this point in the embryo's development. If you do it earlier on, then they're like, all right, fine, I'm going to be part of the brain. So they haven't fully differentiated at that point, and there's a lot we can learn from these type of transplantation experiments. Okay, so transplantation can be within the same embryo, or it can actually be between different species, if they're closely related enough. In fact, frogs and salamanders are closely related enough that we can interchange cells between them, and they will become part of the embryo. They won't necessarily form correctly. Again, that's another interesting experiment we'll go over. But we can do that. So transplantation is exchange of cells within an organism or between organisms. To, to find out, to ask some question, and to find out the answer. Ablation is the destruction or removal of cells from an embryo to ask a particular question. And that's really what these experiments are doing, is to ask the question of how does the brain form? How does the spinal column form? How do the muscles form? What are the factors in that? Now, the genetic is the one that's most commonly used today and gives us the most information. We still do experimental and anatomical approaches, but genetics is where it's at. That's where I spent most of my PhD work is on genetic changes. So the first one is straightforward mutagenesis, which is to cause mutations in a gene and then see what happens. It's, let's say you didn't know how a car worked. You go in and you rip out the radiator. <laughs> then you're going to see what happens after that and say, well, this is what the radiator is associated with, all of these different things with the car. Or you go in and you rip out the battery. Oh, it won't start now. So that's really what we do with genetics is we'll go in, we'll mutate a gene, and then we'll see what problems arise from that. Okay? Sometimes nature does it for us. Sometimes nature will modify something. We'll say, hey, this is different than that. And then we'll do something like phylogenetics where we'll look at the different mutations between species and say, oh, this is why this insect produces wings and this is why this insect produces legs, because of this mutagenesis that occurred naturally. So mutagenesis is just about mutations and then the results in the embryo due to that mutation. Transgenics, this is one where just like a transgenic organism is one that has a foreign gene inserted into it, Transgenics is when we insert uh, uh, some gene. Now, the gene can come from the same embryo where we say, hey, this gene is not normally expressed in these cells. I'm going to make it so that it is. And that's what I did for my PhD work is I artificially made cells that normally wouldn't express this gene to express it. Because I wanted to see if that gene made it so that those cells became neurons. And we found that at a particular stage, they could. After a later stage, they couldn't. So there was a window opportunity where the cells could change their fate in some areas of the embryo. Um, or it could be done between different species. We can take um, one gene from one species and put it in another and say, well, what does this do? Um, one of the more common transgenics that we do is just a labeling where we put GFP or YFP, which is green fluorescent protein or yellow fluorescent protein, um, that's derived from a jellyfish or whatnot, and we tag proteins because we want to see where those proteins are and what they're doing and where they're going and so on and so forth. So sometimes it's not about messing things up, uh, such as mutagenesis. Sometimes it's saying, I really want to see where this protein is being expressed, so I'm going to tag it with a GFP or something like that. So I made chickens glow green. Um, to see where this gene was being expressed. 
you can see here, what does the blue represent? Ectoderm. Okay. Sometimes there will be slightly different shades of blue, depending upon whether it's ectoderm or whether it's going to be um, uh, skin or neurons or whatnot. What's the, the red again? Mesoderm. And what's the yellow? Endoderm. So again, look at how much red there is. There is a lot of components that are mesoderm derivatives, whereas the skin and the nervous system are the primary derivatives of the ectoderm. The endoderm actually doesn't form until much later on. Um, you know, once a lot of these things form, then you start forming some of the rudimentary structures of the digestive system and the respiratory system. The respiratory system is, in fact, the last organ to develop uh, the, the lungs. In fact, uh, uh, scientists are finding now in development that that's one of the things that triggers childbirth, is there is a chemical that's released once the lungs are developed that will initiate um, uh, childbirth. It's basically the timer on the oven, you're done, you know, essentially. So, blood, heart, kidneys, gonads, bone, muscle, connective tissues. See how the mesoderm is quite a substantial uh, um, number of derivatives. Ectoderm, the epidermis, which is the skin, and then the brain. And when we say nervous system, we include spinal column and all essentially peripheral neurons, all neurons that innervate your muscle and your skin and you know, the parts of your body. And then, of course, endoderm is the digestive system and its associated organs, such as the liver and the pancreas and, and whatnot, uh, and then the lungs. In fact, the, it forms as just one long tube, and then from that, you get the various parts budding off from that endoderm to form the various organs. It's very fascinating. At least for me, it is. So, um, now, there are some structures, as we go through here, that are called transient structures. And what we mean by transient is they'll form these layers, but they eventually they'll dissolve. They'll, they'll just, they'll, they'll no longer, they won't incorporate themselves into the embryo. Now, the notochord is one of these things that, that people tend to confuse because they think notochord and they think spinal column. In reality, the notochord is one of these transient structures. Now, we are finding that some this is where the new book comes into play. Some of these cells don't all go away. Some of them actually get incorporated into the vertebral column of the spinal cord. But the notochord itself is kind of a patterning structure, where it patterns most of the germ layers around it, and then the notochord, when it's no longer needed, essentially disintegrates and, it, and it's gone. So not all layers of tissues that you're going to see even though they have their derivatives in, say, the, the mesoderm, the notochord has its derivatives in the mesoderm, um, won't always become part of the embryo itself. And again, you can see the, the coloring here, the, the blue and the yellow and the red. So that, this just kind of shows you a cross-section of the various germ layers that are forming. Again, the blue forming the ectoderm. That's really how the brain and the spinal column forms, is the ectoderm will essentially create this fold and then fold over, and then that tube, which we call the neural tube, will become the brain and the spinal column. And then the remaining ectoderm will become the epidermis or the skin. The next layer, the mesoderm, that forms all of those other structures, the muscle, bone, heart, blood, cartilage, connective tissue, gonads, kidneys, it's, every, it's everything. And then the endoderm, again, which is the lowest layer here, um, the, the digestive and the respiratory. Again, the notochord, even though it's red, because it originates from the mesoderm, is one of those transient structures. It's necessary for patterning of almost all the tissues around it, and then most of it dissolves. But some of them will become part of other structures. The last concept that we need to go over is fate mapping. Now, fate mapping is one of those processes that has a number of ways in which you can approach it. Now, again, you're seeing the same colors that we went over before. We have a zebrafish here, which is um, the actual scientific name is like Derario. Um, frog, which we call Xenopus. Um, mouse, which is Mus Musculus. Funny one. Chicken is Gallus, Gallus Gallus, or Gallus Domesticus. Um, so these are some of the uh, uh, organisms we use when studying vertebrate development.
overcome the germ layers yet. But we've shown by following these cells that this portion of the embryo will contribute and eventually become the ectoderm, the ectoderm germ layer. This region will eventually become the mesoderm, and this region will eventually become the endoderm. So in these earliest stages, you can see that even when there's only a few cells, that already the embryo is patterning itself. We've, we've shown by, by a number of mechanisms that even in the earliest stage as a single egg, there are portions that are fated to become the ectoderm or the mesoderm or the endoderm. We, we assume sometimes that an embryo is universally the same throughout, and it's not. In fact, in most cases, when we create, uh, when women create the oocyte, they actually create regions that have RNA sequestered to them, to that region of the embryo, or RNA sequestered to another region, so that during the cleavage process where the cell is dividing and undergoing mitosis, it's already got different genes that are ready to be transcribed, or they're already transcribed, ready to be translated, and then those proteins will create different areas of the developing embryo. So an oocyte is not universally the same. You've got RNA here, you've got RNA there, you've got um, you know, part of the cytoskeleton that creates different polarities. Even the yolk itself, which is the nutrient portion of the oocyte, in the, um, in the frog embryo, we have what's called the animal pole and the vegetal pole where the animal pole has a tremendous amount of yolk, that actually prevents these cells from creating smaller cells, and the vegetal pole has less yolk, and so the cells are able to divide much more rapidly. And that's kind of what's illustrated in this right here. Yeah. Let's talk about how fate maps are done. There are multiple ways to be able to look at how an embryo, um, how the cells move where they're supposed to move. And each one has their advantages and disadvantages. For example, in some embryos, the cells are naturally colored or different from one another. So you don't have to do anything about it. You can actually just watch the embryo divide, and you can see where some of the cells are going, because there's a natural coloration of some of these cells. So in some cases, we don't have to do anything uh, when we watch these embryos grow. Um, but in a lot of cases, you really can't tell just by looking at the cells um, you can't follow the cells. And that's really what fate mapping is all about, is following where those cells go in the earliest stages of development. So one of the things we can do is you can put a dye in it. So that's what vital dye marking is, is you can, you can inject a dye. That really doesn't affect the, the cell too much. There are some dyes that are better than others. And then you can follow the cell. But there's a problem with this. As the cells grow and divide, what do you think is going to happen to the dye? It gets diluted. So there's only a certain point in which you can follow the cells and their, their derivatives with the vital dye marking. Okay? So there's, that's a limitation to this uh, marking. Now, radioactive labeling pretty much does the same thing as the dye. It's a way of tagging a cell based upon a radioactive isotope that gets incorporated into the cell. But again, you follow the same problem. It can go longer because it's much more sensitive. So radioactive labeling is more sensitive, and so you can follow the cells a lot longer, even though, again, you start getting the, the radioactivity diluted as the cells grow and divide and, and undergo this process. Fluorescent dyes are kind of right up there with radioactive labeling because, again, these have such a high um, uh, um, spectrum in which you can see even just a small amid, uh, amount of fluorescence Again, when you inject fluorescence into a, a, an embryo, you can follow them um, uh, in that regard. So vital dye, radioactive, and fluorescence, in that order, uh, have longer and longer uh, time periods in which you can follow the cells. If you just label a cell with a dye and say, okay, well, where does it go? You can just follow them longer and longer with that. Now, the one that can be permanent is the genetic marking. Okay, genetic marking can be absolutely permanent. Now, there's two ways in which you can do this. The first way is genetic embryology, such as transgenics. You pretty much just put a gene uh, 
into the cell's uh, um, nucleus, and every time it copies its genetic information, it will copy that gene as well. This is what we do when we say insert a GFP, a green fluorescent protein, to tag a cell. Or you can put another type of genetic marker in there. The long and the short of it is you can put a gene that can be permanent in the cell's uh, nucleus so that every time the cell divides, it won't, uh, it won't get diluted because it'll copy that gene and then that will be part of every cell's fate from there on. The other way in which this can be done is you can actually do an experimental approach using genetic marking. Let's go back to that and let me show you how. Let's look at here. A transplantation experiment can be used for genetic marking. Let me explain how that's done. This is typically done between different species. So let's say you use a quail and a chick egg. If you uh, take cells from a chicken and put it in a quail or vice versa, they have enough genes in common that the cells will behave as they normally should. However, there are subtle differences in the quail genetics versus the chicken genetics, in which case, after a certain point in time, you can use some type of uh, chemical detection or fluorescent detection to see where, which cells have that gene that would not be found in the chicken embryo. So you can actually trace the lineage of quail cells based upon the uniqueness of the quail genetics. So you can actually do genetic uh, marking with either one of these. You can do it with transgenics where you actually put the gene in it and then follow the, the, the uh, ancestry of that or the um, genealogy of that cell. Or you can take cells from a closely related species and it behaves fairly the same, almost identical to the others, and you can actually then look at the genetics that are different in, say, the quail cells or the uh, other or the chick cells. 